Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final lesson of IB Physics Year 2. I'm joined today with Cassandra and Kelvin. You guys should say hi to everybody. Hi. Did you know you said, hey, guys, within the first 30 seconds, the YouTube algorithm would help you. So here we go. Hey, guys. Nice. Awesome. I'm also here. Well, who is that? Is that Ethan? Yes. Great. I'm glad you can make it, Ethan. So today we're going to be talking about stellar evolution, which is essentially how stars are born, how they live, and how they die. Just talking about the life cycles of stars. So obviously we need to start with the birth of stars. So how are stars born? Well, they're born inside nebulas, which are, ironically enough, the leftover remains of giant massive stars that exploded billions of years ago. Here's a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope called the Carina Nebula. It's this giant, massive, huge uh, area in interstellar space just filled with a bunch of debris and like the leftover guts of some previously exploded stars. Uh, this little region, uh, let me, I'll draw, I can draw on this, can't I? So this region here, we'll zoom in on it. Here's a more high def image zoomed in. So this region is called a stellar nursery. And you'll notice that there's these little like clumps that are sort of coming off the edge of this cloud, like all these different clumps there. And in those locations, new stars are being born. So what you need to know is that stars are formed out of contracting gases in this interstellar medium. So mainly it's made of hydrogen. So this is all like the leftover debris of these ancient stars that exploded. There's all this hydrogen. Most of it was there from the, from the Big Bang. This hydrogen just collapses down due to gravitational pressures and it creates a star. The star that gets created is called a protostar, by the way. What's up, guys? Someone want to say something? So a star that dies just makes baby stars. It's, an, it's, a, it's like a hydra. Yeah, it has to be a really, really, really big star, like so big. Like we don't even have stars that big in the universe anymore. But in the early, early days of the universe, there were stars that were so massive, they burned so bright. There was no one around to see the starlight, though, because life hadn't evolved in the universe yet. But these just gigantic, massive stars, they only lived for about 100, 100 million years. And then they explode and then they seed all the future generations of stars. This is, uh, have you guys, I'm sure you've seen the Orion Nebula, like the, not Nebula, the Orion Constellation, like the three belts, the belt of Orion, like it's one of the most prominent constellations in the Northern Hemisphere. So mm. in Orion's crotch, there's a nebula. Now you can't see it with the naked eye, like it's too faint, but if you have any, like a normal, any crappy telescope can point at it and you can see it. So here's what the Orion Nebula looks like. There's this really, really famous picture taken back in the 1990s by the Hubble Space Telescope. They called this the Pillars of Creation. And so there you go again, you can see those regions of star formation where these little tiny balls are peeling off from this nebula to create stars. I also want to show you guys this, this is the Andromeda Galaxy. So I didn't want to show you a picture of the Milky Way Galaxy because it would have to be computer generated. Since we are in the Milky Way Galaxy, we can't take a picture of our own galaxy. But this is the closest galaxy to us called the Andromeda Galaxy. It's two and a half million light years away. And what you'll notice in this image, there's these little like red areas. And anytime you see those red pockets, those are regions of star formation. And so you can see like just throughout a typical galaxy at the time that we're alive to witness, there's just star formation happening all across the galaxy, all across the universe. In every galaxy, there's regions of star formation. So we happen to be alive at a period of high activity as far as star formation goes, but not like, you know, stars have always been formed since the beginning of the universe. But what's special about our time is that there's also life here to be able to watch it and to be able to understand it and to be able to see it. And that's, that's awesome. It's the coolest part about when we, when we exist is that we can actually look out and understand the, the cosmos around us. So star formation happens all the time, all over the place. Okay, so as a star contracts under its own weight, you know, gravity is like pulling it together. What happens is all that gravitational potential energy turns into thermal energy and the star gets really, really, really hot. And then it's, what happens is it starts to move towards the main sequence. So here's the HR diagrams that we talked about last class. So you notice that depending upon how massive the star is, it takes a different path towards the main sequence. But basically you're starting off as this uh, just this you know cloud and you're collapsing down and as it collapses it starts to get hotter so the temperature starts to increase and you start to move over towards the main sequence. And so that's why over here it's saying zero age main sequence. And so these numbers are the time that it takes 
to get to the main sequence. So you can see that these really massive stars, 100 times more massive than the sun, they're taking 10 to the fourth year. So about 10,000 years from that stage of like initial birth to collapse to turn into a star. Whereas where the sun is, so here's here's our path right here, it took about 10 to the sixth years. It took a little bit over a million years. So the sun exists in this state of just a dust cloud collapsing for a little, for more than a million years. And then it finally starts to collapse down. And then once it gets to the main sequence, that's when it can actually be hot enough to start fusion to occur and it actually ignites. Okay, what was I going to say here? Uh, yeah, our sun took about 20 to 30 million years to make it to the main sequence. So then the sun ignites, uh, fusion starts taking hold, and you can even see that some planets start to get created in the leftover debris that didn't turn into the star. All that extra debris out there can start to coalesce into planets and moons and comets and all that other cool stuff. By the way, I stole these images from uh, a video. I should have given credit to it. It's a video called um, the time lapse of the entire universe. It's on a YouTube channel called Melody Sheep. You guys should check it out. Maybe I'll link to it. Is it a relative of Dolly the Sheep? No, it's just this guy did these old videos called Symphony of Science, where he'd take scientists talking and he'd auto tune them into music. It was it's like one of the cool. I'm, I can't believe you haven't seen it before, but I'll, I'll link to it. All right, so once we get to the to the main sequence, uh, once the temperature reaches this temperature, which is about 5 million Kelvin, that's a lot of you, Kelvin. Once we reach 5 million Kelvin, you can start to have nuclear uh, fusion occur. And so the fusion prevents any further collapse. So the gravitational pull is pulling all this debris, pulling all of this stuff together until fusion happens. And now there's this outward radiation pressure, like we talked about last time, that can support the collapse. And so now the star reaches an equilibrium state. It's now on the main sequence. And so that's, Careful. yeah, what's up? Does that mean that I'm the cause of the birth of the universe? <laughs> well, and our just, Earth, the life of everything? unit of temperature. <laughs> we would need 5 million of you in order for a fusion to occur. Well, that's going to take a long time. Yes. So once once you're on the main sequence, then what's happening is the proton, that proton-proton cycle that I talked about in the previous video, that proton-proton cycle is happening and it's releasing energy that's keeping the star in relative equilibrium. I mean, there's there's some stars that are called uh, Cepheid variable stars. I was supposed to teach you guys about that, but I didn't. But they actually enter these periods of like uh, instability where they like burn off their outer layers and it like flashes and lights up and then they cool down again and then they burn off again. Anyway, I was supposed to mention that, but basically you got this proton proton cycle happening. Stars are steadily turning hydrogen into helium and preventing their gravitational collapse. And that's what all the stars in the main sequence are doing. So that's why we call it the main sequence. Cause it's sort of like the, the normal place where stars are going to be found is they're most likely going to be found in this main sequence. It's where stars are stable, where stars are happy, where stars are thriving and living. So stars spend most of their life on the main sequence. The sun will be on the main sequence for about 12, that's not million, that's billion, for 12 billion years. So it took 20 million years to collapse into the star, that dust cloud but the sun will now exist for 12 billion years. So we're about four and a half billion years into that 12 billion year lifespan. So the question is what causes a star to leave the main sequence? So it seems like, you know, thing, things are good. Things are stable. Like you've got this fusion pushing this radiative energy from the fusion pushing out. You got gravity pulling in. Well, what causes a star to leave the main sequence is if there's instabilities in this balance. Do you guys have any ideas? Like what, what do you think could happen? that a star would leave the main sequence. It fuses too much. Fuses too much? So what do you mean by too much? Uh, it creates way, it releases way much more, so much more energy when it's fusing, when it's fusing like high, like compounds together. Right. So, well, well, like I said, on the main sequence, you're taking hydrogen and turning it into helium. So when would a star leave the main sequence is when it starts to do what? I think you're on helium the right and the lith and there helium you know. and the lithium. So if it starts going helium off into heavier elements, that's when it's going to leave the main sequence. So main sequence stars are primarily fusing hydrogen into helium. So that's what's going to happen is the star will leave the main sequence once it starts to use up most of its hydrogen. So we the cutoff point is about 12%. So once the star has 
consumed or burned 12% of its hydrogen, turned it into helium, what will happen is a bunch of instabilities will start to build up within the star, and it's going to make it leave the main sequence. So when a star leaves the main sequence, this is what it looks like. It's got this shell of hydrogen here, this hydrogen shell, and then it's got a helium core. So all that helium that it created throughout its life, since it's heavier, it's going to fall down into the core, and you'll have this ring or this shell of hydrogen around the core. And then at that point, that's when the star starts to leave. Once 12% once of the hydrogen is turned into helium, then the star starts to leave the main sequence. There are two possible paths that a star can take off the main sequence, and it just depends upon how massive the star is. So if you're a low mass star, so low mass stars means about eight solar masses or less, you'll go through the life cycle shown on the left. And if you're a high mass star, which means you have eight or more solar masses, then you'll go through the process on the right. Obviously, the low mass stars are way more interesting. They have a way more um, elaborate and crazy path that they take through the HR diagram, whereas high mass stars uh, just very quickly die, whereas low mass stars take die over a really long time. All right, let's go into more detail. Um, maybe you guys have seen diagrams like this before. I use this one because it was the only one that Google listed as available for reuse, but there's way better pictures out there. So there's two halves of this diagram, right? You got high mass stars over here, and then you got low mass stars over here. But notice that everything is starting from that same uh, star forming nebula, that same proto star, that nebula. All stars start off in nebulas. If you're a low mass star, like the sun, what'll happen is you'll, you'll turn into a red giant, then you'll explode into a planetary nebula, turn into a white dwarf, and eventually cool off into a black dwarf. So that's the path that our sun is going to take. Other stars can take other paths through there. Like if you're a little bit smaller of a star, you actually never really make it to a mid-sized star like the sun. You actually turn into what's called a red dwarf. I think red dwarfs are actually the most numerous types of stars in, in, the, in, in the galaxy or in the universe. But that would go in this direction. You're still going to end up in the same place. Now, high mass stars do something spectacular, right? I'm sure you guys have heard of this. So high mass stars, they can actually explode into supernova explosions. And if the star is really, really big, after it supernova explodes, it can actually turn into a black hole. And so I'm planning to talk to you guys in this video about all of this stuff, all the different life cycles, all the different paths that stars can take through their lives, through their life. But you'll notice that the end result is black dwarf, neutron star, black hole black hole. So those are the end results of all stars. All stars are either going to turn into a black dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole. Okay, so we're going to talk mainly about low mass stars. So remember what's happened is that the star has um, throughout you know, most of its life and is on the main sequence, it was burning hydrogen in its core, and then slowly over time helium starts to build up in the core. So in, in the main sequence, you have a hydrogen core that's burning. But once you start to build up that helium, remember 12% of the hydrogen, now the core becomes helium, but the core is not hot enough to fuse helium. So what happens is the hydrogen burning is taking place in a shell around the core. So helium collects in the core, surrounded by a thin shell of hydrogen and a bigger hydrogen envelope. And so this bigger region out here, so all of this stuff out here, this is the hydrogen envelope. And you just have this little teeny tiny shell, in, like right in there, this little tiny shell where the hydrogen can actually burn. So the hydrogen can only burn on this thin inner shell, and then that's where the fusion is happening. So once ha once, once this starts to happen, once you start having that hydrogen burning, once, once it moves out of the core and moves out to the shell, the star starts to move off the main sequence. And so it'll, it'll go off in this direction. So normally the sun would be here and see the luminosity of one, and then the temperature of about uh, 6,000 Kelvin, the sun starts to move off into what's called the red giant branch of the HR diagram. Here's what a red giant looks like. So a red giant is humongous. So the star basically just starts to expand out and just get really, really, really large. And this is what's happening when that fusion, instead of happening inside the core, the fusion is happening in that shell. The whole star starts to expand, right? Because you're building up more and more helium and then it just starts to, droop, starts to grow and blow up really big. So here's the sun uh, when, it was a, when it was on the main sequence. That's the size of the sun. And then droop, it turns into a red giant. When the sun turns into a red giant, it's going to swallow Mercury and swallow Venus. That's how big it's going to get and impossibly swallow the Earth. Uh, we just don't really know yet. Like we haven't collected enough data to really know what's going to happen. 
So this is the HR diagram. And so you can see like this path up to here, you got all these giants up here. And so we suspect that all of these giant stars, they used to be like the sun, they used to be on the main sequence. All right, the temperature and pressure of the helium builds up eventually. And then eventually the helium itself, I don't know what I wrote there, but the helium is going to start to fuse. So once like the temperature and the pressure start to build and build and build and build, you actually can start to have a helium fusion occur. And this is through what's called the triple alpha process. So it actually doesn't turn helium into lithium. It actually takes two, high, two heliums, makes beryllium, and then throw another helium in there to make carbon. And so this is how all the carbon in the universe, you know, the carbon that life is based on, all the carbon in the universe was created inside red giant stars through this triple alpha process. This is, this is the only process in the universe that creates carbon, which is the ingredients you need for life. And that's kind of cool to think about. At this point, the star enters into what's called the horizontal branch phase, where it's happily and steadily burning helium inside its core. So eventually what happens is once the helium starts to burn, it's like once it reaches hot enough, what was that temperature again? 100 million Kelvin. So once the core hits 100 million, there's this thing called a helium flash and it starts to fuse the helium at its core. So now the star is back to another stability region where there's now fusion at its core where the helium is burning and you still have that little bit of a hydrogen, you still have that hydrogen burning shell out there. So you have this helium burning core and you have this hydrogen burning shell. And then that moves the star off into what's called the horizontal branch over there. Can we see the horizontal branch here? Not really. Very, this, this, as you can see, this doesn't, the horizontal branch should be over to there. The horizontal branch doesn't last for very long. The star will very quickly run out of helium. Like helium is not a very efficient fusion process. Uh, I could show you why down here there's the, if you guys remember the binding energy. So remember how helium has like that little spike right there? So helium is not as efficient at uh, releasing energy from fusion because it has a higher binding energy. So the helium fusing phase is a very short-lived phase. So it's about 100 million years. The star will start to build up this carbon core, right? So the helium is going to be slowly turning into carbon. Oh, I forgot to mention a little bit of oxygen also gets made. So, you know, if you throw three, this triple alpha. So here's, you got your triple alphas. There's an alpha, there's an alpha, and then throw in another alpha, you got carbon. Well, throw in another alpha, and you can also make some oxygen, but this doesn't happen as readily as the carbon does. So you can you can get a little bit of oxygen produced, but it's mainly going to be carbon. Okay, so what's eventually going to happen is that the core is going to start to build up a bunch of carbon, and the, and it's not the star is not hot enough. There's not enough gravitational pressure like pulling in to create the temperatures that you need to fuse carbon. And then what's going to happen is the same thing that happened before when the star started accumulating helium in its core, where it grew and grew and grew. The stars actually going to start growing again back into the giant branch so it's going to like ramp back up to where it was before but now it's going to be an even bigger star than before uh, let's see so now you've got fusion occurring at two shells so you have the hydrogen shell and you have the helium shell and so now that that energy is so far out from the core it's just this dr like dramatic like ridiculous amount of energy starts to just be spit out of the star it'll actually start to blow off the outer layers so like the outer layers of the star will start to get ripped off like they'll start to get shedded from the star as all this energy starts flying out from these two fusion rings and that'll create what's called a planetary nebula so here are two actual photos of planetary nebulas so this is the act of a star that has left that horizontal branch it's left that stability of that helium core and it started to build up too much carbon at its core, and it just starts to just shed its outer layers in this explosion called a planetary nebula explosion. Uh, what else is going to say? Oh, yeah. So the reason I'm showing these two pictures is because on this picture, we're sort of edge on. So like what it actually ends up looking like is these two like explosions out to the sides. And depending upon where you're looking at it from, like where the Earth, our perspective is. So this picture is like imagine if you're looking at it from this direction you'll see this ring like this but actually like realize if you went through that if you went through that ring and then you know looked at it from this side you'd see this other picture so uh, those are just two different planetary nebulas pretty famous pictures you guys have probably seen these before i'm gonna pause because i feel like i've been talking too long you guys have any comments or anything you want to talk about so stars die they make more stars Yes. Some stars turn into big stars, and then they 
burn their helium, then they no burn their hydrogen right. through most of their hydrogen, burn through most of their helium, create carbon. And then once they burn through the carbon, they start creating more stuff. And potentially sometimes they can create oxygen. And that the entire reason that carbon exists in the universe is because some stars turned into red giants and turned them and made carbon. Yep. From that hydrogen that was left over from the Big Bang. Yep. Cool stuff. So yeah, the stars died, Calvin. Like you're right on the money, man. Like this star is dead. Like once the planetary nebula explosion happens, all that's left behind is the core of the star. And so this is what path the star takes. So right here, this is where you have that planetary nebula, the where they're calling it here the envelope ejection. IB calls it the planetary nebula. The 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 star is going to heat up as that happens because you have all that that fusion happening. But then it's gonna its core as after its layers shed, right? It's gonna get um going to get hotter because the outer layers start to shed and so now what's left is just the cores there so that's why the that's why the star is getting hotter it's not because it's like releasing more energy it's getting hotter the temperature is increasing because the outer layers are being shed and so like the outer layers are cool well those sh outer layers are being exhaust like ejected out into space and so all that's left is that hot bare core and then eventually once that core itself is exposed to space it'll start to cool down and it'll start to cool and cool, and it'll turn into a white dwarf. Remember, this is cooling. Going to the right means cooling. Okay, what did I say over here? Stars now dead. No fusion takes place within its collapsing core. The extremely high pressure conditions in the core mean that electrons behave as a gas, and the pressure they generate keeps the core from collapsing further. This pressure is called the electron degeneracy pressure, and it's a result of a quantum mechanical effect called the Pauli exclusion principle. So I just briefly wanted to talk about the Pauli exclusion principle. I think I had a, I had a picture. I should have put this picture up here. So what will happen is you normally matter looks like this, right? With like the nucleus and then the electrons whirling around it. But when the core collapses, like there's a tremendous amount of gravitational pressure here and there's no longer any radiative energy from the fusion to push out. So gravity just starts to boom, like pull the whole star in. And what will happen is the atoms will actually get so packed together like so compressed together that the electrons from one atom start to overlap with the electron orbits from another atom and when these electrons start occupying the same quantum state it starts to create what's called an electron degeneracy pressure and so that's what's happening is like the atoms have been squished down so much that they actually start to repel each other and so this pressure now can actually end up supporting the collapsing core so rather than having that fusion pushing out and that, that energy from the fusion radiating outward to prevent the gravitational collapse. Now the core itself collapses down to the point where the electron actually start to occupy the same quantum state and they can't do that. So they start to push out against each other. So it's kind of like saying like gravity is trying to collapse the star, but it can't get past this electron barrier. So there's like this, this electron pressure barrier that it can't get past. And it's a result of what's called the Pauli exclusion principle. It says it's a quantum effect. It says uh, no two electrons may occupy the same quantum state. So what you end up with is a white dwarf. This and this and this is a stable star. So it's it's prevented from collapsing by this electron degeneracy pressure. So the core is now a white dwarf. So here's what a white dwarf would look like. This is not an actual picture. This is a, a rendered computer image. The core is now exposed to space there's no further energy source and so the star is doomed to cool down to practically zero temperature and when that happens it'll become a black dwarf so it's a white dwarf right now because it's still hot like it still has all this thermal energy you know from all the fusion that took place like it was millions of degrees hot at one point and so it's just going to slowly over time radiate that energy like a black body would the problem is that there's no extra source of energy to continue to fuel that process. And so it will just slowly start to have more energy coming out. Then it's being added into it and it just starts to cool down to zero. And then it, when it becomes a black dwarf, it's no longer even visible. So it's not releasing any light in the visible part of the spectrum. I just want to give you guys a sense of scale here. So a white dwarf is about the size of the earth. So you took this, the sun, that was this big and you've collapsed it down until it's about the size of the planet earth which is nuts oh the other thing that's cool is uh do you guys know what what white dwarfs are mainly made out of so like what element are they primarily composed of
What elements are white dwarfs made of? Go back up here. What element are white dwarfs? Whoa! whoa, whoa. <laughs> what element are white dwarfs made of? Did I lose you guys? Are we still there? We're still, We're still here. I lost still connection. For a I lost connection a little bit too. Oh, okay. And I sure. heard. Yeah. I heard you. I just. I, I just couldn't think of the answer. So look at this picture. So whoop, that's the wrong picture. That's the horizontal branch. This is it. So this is when the star starts to go through the planetary nebula. It looks like this. So what is the core of the star, the white dwarf? What's it going to be made of? Carbon. carbon. Yeah. It's going to be made of carbon. These outer layers end up getting ejected out and they fly off the star. They push it out and then all that's left is carbon. So when you look at this image down here of the white dwarf, this is mainly carbon, but it's carbon that was under an extremely high gravitational pressure, pushing it, squeezing it in at really high temperatures. So it's actually not carbon. That's not what you'd call it. What do you call carbon when it's under extreme pressure and extreme temperatures? What does carbon turn into? Diamond. You got it. It turns into diamond. And so this is basically a star that's a giant diamond. And we've actually verified that these things are made of diamonds. So it's a diamond the size of Earth, which is pretty awesome to think about. I want to kidnap one. <laughs> I want one. Give me a white dwarf. Mr. Keppel, uh, yeah. this question, uh, me and my dad, it's been recurring to us uh, ever since like we started talking about the course. How did we get all this information? Yeah, isn't that awesome? So it's all from looking at the spectrum of the stars. So by looking at the light spectrum, you'll remember that there's dips in the spectrum, like the different absorption bands. They tell us what the star is made of. So we figured all of this out from the light signature that the stars are, are, are sending out to us. And also, you know, understanding how nuclear fusion works within the lab settings, like we're able to recreate these conditions here on Earth so we can study them and see that, yeah, this is what's happening. So we know what stars are made of because of the light that they send off to us. You know, we can measure their different luminosity and temperatures and all that stuff and chart all this out. So that's how we figured this out. You know, can we know for sure that this is happening? Well, of course not. But we're we're like 99.9999% sure that this is what's going on. Does that Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's that my <laughs> questions. So it's all based on the light that they send to us. It tells us what they're made of. Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah, so now we got to talk about this guy who has a name that I can't pronounce, Chandra Sekhar. So Chandra Sekhar found out that um, he's the one that found out about electron degeneracy and that this creates a limit. And so he went and actually calculated, all right, so – the electron degeneracy prevents the core from collapsing any further. Like it gets down to the point where the electrons in the atoms are actually occupying the same quantum state and they start to push apart from each other. But what if there is an even stronger pressure? So like what if there is an even stronger gravitational force, like an even more massive star that was able to pull past that limit? So this limit of the electron degeneracy pressure is called the Chandra Sekhar limit. And what he found out that it was 1.4 solar masses. So if that core, if that core of the star right there, that what the, if that core is greater than 1.4 solar masses, just the core, mind you, not the star that created it, the core of the star is 1.4 solar masses, you can actually surpass that limit and you can actually collapse even further. So that would mean that you would need a massive, massive star. Because realize, like, yeah, so all of, let me go back up here. So here, this picture. So all of this, this whole entire star here is, let's say it's the sun. So it's like the mass of the sun. So this is the sun when, you know, 12 billion years in the future or whatever. But realize that the core is only a tiny fraction of the mass of that star. In fact, it's, you know, roughly the size of the Earth. Well, obviously, it's way, way more dense than the Earth. But still... You're thinking about the core of the star, right? So, like, you have to have a core, a leftover core, after all those outer layers are ejected out. That leftover core has to be greater than 1.4 solar masses. And if that happens, you can actually push past the Chandra Sekhar limit and start to create things like neutron stars and black holes. But I just wanted to take a moment here and take pause and sort of evaluate where we were. So, we said that if the initial mass of the star, is really low, like 0.08 to 0.25% of the sun's mass, then you'll just get a white dwarf with a helium core. So it will never have gotten hot enough to, to go into carbon. So this this star would just go straight into um, 
it would never be able to burn helium. It would just it would end. Now, if you're if you're within the range of 0.25 to 8, you actually that's the pathway that the sun's going to take. You can actually end up with that carbon core, that white dwarf carbon core. If you're a little bit heavier than that, like 8 to 12 solar masses, then you can actually have a oxygen, neon, or magnesium core. So you can actually fuse a little bit heavier elements together, but you're not going to be able to pass the Chandra Sekhar limit. So the Chandra Sekhar limit uh, it was discovered by this guy. I don't remember his last name or his first name, but we all call him Chandra Sekhar. He's a really famous dude. He figured out about this electron degeneracy pressure. Let's talk about high mass stars. So Kelvin, you've been alluding to this. So in really massive stars, carbon's not the limit, right? So like in a massive star, it's not going to stop at carbon. It's going to keep going further to neon, oxygen, silicon, iron. Like it's going to have all these layers of fusion happening throughout the entire star. But then something really bad happens, something catastrophic happens. Once you hit iron, well, iron is at the peak of the binding energy chart. And once you start to try to fuse iron, you actually end up losing energy when you do that. So instead of gaining energy, you actually end up losing energy. So energy is going to be required to go past iron. And so that means the star has no energy source. So iron is the peak of the binding energy curve. So once you start to produce iron, the fusion process is no longer releasing energy, but rather it's absorbing energy. And so this star is going to die. It does not have a source of energy any longer. It, it, it's 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 going to die. It so this is what, what's up. Consume itself. Well, let's 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 find out what happens. So we're going to start to move off the the main sequence so we're gonna so this is what's happening here we start to move off the main sequence and notice that we're starting up really high you know the sun is down here uh the sun has is a low mass star so you know you're like one solar radius but notice that this star up here is like way bigger like it's 10 times bigger than than our than our sun so this star is way more massive so it actually starts to it's able to get up to iron but once it hits iron it, it very quickly starts to go this direction so that means it's cooling down so the star starts to cool down because it's, it no longer has that source of energy uh, at its core to sustain it. It starts to cool down. So as the star moves off the main sequence, it moves up into the red supergiant area. So the red giants were down here. This is the supergiant. Like these are massive, huge stars. And so now even heavier elements are produced. Like you're creating all those, all those other elements in there. Like tons and tons of elements are being produced readily within the star. And then what actually happens is like there's so much energy coming out of all this fusion at all these levels of the star, all this fusion is happening, that it actually, these photons that get ejected have so much energy that they can actually rip, they can actually rip nu nuclei apart. So like th all that, you know, all that careful work that the star did to like assemble these, you know, nuclei together to fuse them to make these bigger elements, all that work gets undone in an instant because the star starts, so much energy starts coming out of it that it just starts to rip apart all the things that it had already made. So in a very short amount of time, the star is composed mainly of protons, electrons, neutrons, and photons. And so this is the, the star is now collapsing down, right? That's what I was trying to, I didn't say that, but the star starts to collapse because there's no, there's no longer that radiation pressure pushing out. The star starts to collapse and that's what's happening. It's like all these really heavy elements start to get produced, even heavier than iron, all these heavy elements start getting produced. And, but in a very short order, the star is literally just protons, electrons, neutrons and photons and they're all disassociated from each other and what happens is that as the star continues to collapse further and further those electrons actually start to get pushed into protons and so protons can no longer exist the only thing that you can have are now neutrons remember neutron is the higher energy version of a proton if you remember back from our particle physics topic so neutrons are a higher energy version of the of the proton and so now protons can't exist because there's just too much energy in this star that it's literally just made of neutrons so the star's core is now made almost entirely of neutrons and it's rapidly collapsing so the Pauli exclusion principle is now going to take hold but instead of it being with electrons it's going to take hold for for neutrons the neutrons are going to start to get squeezed into each other and they can't occupy the same quantum state and so then as the star is collapsing it will reach that point where the neutrons start to try to get pushed together and they can't and then it will just boom it'll like bounce off that so it's kind of confusing but this, so imagine you have like this collapsing core and it gets to the point where the neutrons are there's a neutron pressure, which is like beyond that Chandra Sekhar limit. And then the star's collapsing core actually bounces off the center and it explodes out into a supernova. 
So the collapsing core rebounds off this neutron barrier, and it just sends this enormous shockwave traveling outwards from the star, tearing apart its outer layers in a supernova explosion. So I wanted to show you guys this image on the right. So this is a fake computer-generated image. Like, we've actually never taken a picture of a supernova in our galaxy. It's never happened since we've had technology. But we have seen supernovas in other galaxies. So take a look at this. So here's a supernova right here orbiting uh, this galaxy. So it's orbiting around this galaxy. And what you'll notice is that one star, that one star is as bright, so there's as much luminosity coming off that, as the core of a galaxy. And the core of a galaxy is, you know, on the order of a billion stars. So you've got a billion stars here. I'll just put ish. And then one star here. So a supernova releases so much energy in that explosion and that rebounding off the core that it actually shines as bright as like a billion stars. And that's just a ridiculous amount of energy. This is one of the most energetic events that can happen in the universe. Would we feel the shockwave on Earth if a star went supernova? Well, you'll notice that the energy is actually coming out in these jets. And so you would be pretty okay as long as you weren't too close and as long as this jet didn't hit you. So if the Earth was in, like if the Earth was here and that jet was coming right at us, it would basically, uh, you know, vaporize the Earth. The Earth would get ripped apart instantly. Yeah, it's oh. a ridiculous amount of energy. So I think it's, I think 100 light years is the limit. Like you don't want to be within 100 light years of a supernova. That's really large. Yeah, it's big, but it's also the galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across so it's not that bad <laughs> and there are no stars within 100 light years of us that are even at risk of going supernova so we don't have to really worry about it unless a star goes supernova and we're right in that path that's bad but you know the odds of that are pretty low i think <laughs> All right, so the core that's left behind now, because remember the core was, it bounced off that neutron barrier. So it's it's way, gonna go way past the Chandra Sekhar limit. And so now it's the neutron pressure that keeps the core from collapsing. And that creates what's called a neutron star. So remember that picture before where like the electrons started to overlap with each other? Well, now you basically have what's called a baryon degenerate matter. Remember baryons are things that are made of quarks. So this entire star is all just packed together baryons like that's it it's just that's why we call it a neutron star i mean they're really all neutrons but it's just like there's no more room for electrons all the electrons have gotten pushed into protons and turned into neutrons and all the matter is just pushed together so it's it's essentially i mean i i mean i i pause to say this but it's basically an atom the size of a star if you want but it doesn't have any electrons on it but it's essentially a nu the nucleus of an atom, but it's the size of a star, which is nuts. Well, actually, it's the size of a city, because neutron stars are really dense and so small that they're about the size of a, a major metropolitan area. Okay. Neutron stars are ridiculously dense, and the reason is because all that empty space, you know, like if you have an atom, so normally atoms are like that, and then you have that little teeny tiny nucleus. Well, imagine if that nucleus filled the entire space. That's a neutron star. So they, you know, that's like with, uh, in the Avengers, like Thor's hammer was made of neutron star material, which is why it's so dense and so powerful and so heavy. You know, if you actually had like a, like a teaspoon full of neutron star and you let it go, it actually punch a hole through the earth. <laughs> that is insane. The most powerful weapon of all is a neutron star. Here's an infographic about neutron stars. Um, I'm just gonna leave it up there. I don't want to go through the whole thing, but you guys can go in there and read about it. It's from Nature Magazine. Yeah, so we've been studying neutron stars through X-ray uh, spectroscopy. So neutron stars, uh, there's so much energy being released by them that you, you know it's, it doesn't even show up in the visible. Like you got to go beyond visible up to X-ray. So we have lots of telescopes that are looking at all this stuff and figuring out what's going on by looking at the signature of the light that they send out and figuring out all that stuff. Uh, neutron stars also are uh, highly magnetic. Uh, they create like massive magnetic fields around them. Uh, spinning neutron stars are called pulsars. They send out radio waves that we can pick up. It's There's all sorts of really cool stuff like that. All right, so let's talk. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about is what if you're even more massive than that 1.4? So remember, the 1.4 solar masses, that was the uh, Chandra-Sekhar limit. Well, what if you're more than that? So, uh, you know, the neutron star goes beyond that. But is there another limit? So, like, is there another... Like, is there another force that's, what am I trying to, I don't know what I'm trying to say, guys. 
What I'm trying to say is there's a second limit. It's called the Oppenheimer or Oppenheimer Volkov limit. And that's about two to three solar masses. So if the core of the star is about, you know, two or three times the, the mass of the sun, then you can actually push through that neutron degeneracy pressure. You can actually push through that neutron barrier. And that's called the Op Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer Volkov limit. And if that happens, then the star will probably turn into a black hole. And so that's what we're looking at here is pictures of a black hole. So if the core is 1.5 solar masses, you'll get the neutron star. But if it's uh, greater than two to three, you'll turn into a black hole. Here are some pictures. This is an actual picture of a black hole. You guys probably saw it. It was one of the most viewed images of all time last year. The actual picture of the black hole, you can see the, the center of it is, is dark. There's nothing there because black hole is such a, dense clump clump of matter that not even light can escape the gravitational pull. I mean, think about it. Like the black hole was formed because the gravitational pressure was so strong that not even the neutron degeneracy pressure could stop it from collapsing, that there's no force strong enough in the universe to prevent its collapse. So obviously light's not going to be able to escape from it either. Uh, this is what computer models say that black holes should look like. So uh, it's all this weird, crazy distortions because black holes like warp and twist the fabric of space. You know, all these crazy stuff happening. So the weirdest thing is this part that's on the top here is actually this ring, but viewed from behind the black hole and the light actually bent up around the curved space up to here. Likewise, this bottom part down here is the underside of the ring on the opposite side of the black hole because there's just all these crazy like space bending, distortion things that are happening inside a black hole. Here's a really cool infographic about black holes. Uh, it, it's black holes are just crazy guys. Like I, you, you could spend your entire rest of your life studying black holes and you still wouldn't know everything about them. I mean, we don't, there's, we don't really know too much about black holes. Like we have our, our theories of physics break down. So we have two main theories in physics right now. There's general relativity, which talks about massive, you know, gravitational fields and, you know, the fabric of space, like the curvature of space, like that's for like really large things, you know, across like, you know, uh, space scales. And then the second theory of physics is quantum mechanics, which deals with, you know, nuclear scales, like really tiny, small scale effects. Well, a black hole is both a nuclear sized object and a gravitationally massive object. And so we don't have a theory that works for both of those together. So we have theories that can explain really well the gravitational effects of stars and things like that. We have a theory that works really well to explain the quantum mechanical effects within the nucleus of atoms, but we don't have a theory that works well to explain both of those things simultaneously. So we need a new theory, and that's what uh, string theory is supposed to fix, but string theory has been having a lot of problems lately. But that's sort of the quest right now in physics is to figure out a theory that can explain black holes because we currently don't have that theory. So if you do go off and study physics in college, uh, you won't or learn about this because this is beyond that. But if you go to graduate school, you can start doing this stuff. And then maybe if you ever become a professor, you can crack the code and figure out that theory of everything, which is what physicists are currently looking for. So just to recap, uh, to summarize what we talked about today is how stars die, how stars live and how they die. So we talked about the various outcomes that happen. So we said that stars will either become white dwarfs neutron stars or black holes and it all depends upon how big they are when they start off and so you'll notice that only stars that are 40 times larger than the sun can turn into black holes so the black hole is not going to happen with the sun the sun isn't big enough but there are stars out there that are more than 40 times bigger than the sun they can turn into black holes so neutron stars happen between the range of 12 to 40 times bigger than black holes for anything larger than that. So remember, the white dwarfs are stopped by electron degeneracy. Neutron stars are stopped by neutron degeneracy. And black holes are not stopped by anything. They just consume, like Kelvin, like you said earlier, they consume themselves. They fall down into, into you know, a singularity, like an infinitely small speck. That's it. I'm done, guys. Unless you have anything, I'm going to stop the recording. Holy <laughs> hour long video. Woohoo! <laughs> well, I'm supposed to talk, I'm supposed to teach for 50 minutes, so now I'm done. I hit my 50 minutes. We're good. And uh, I'm going to end the video here, guys.